maybe as a, a tiny bit of a, a preamble in case some folks are still arriving. Today is our summer solstice. And just curious, you know, this is not a holiday that Buddhism really has a lot to say about, but it is a really wonderful opportunity to feel connected to the natural world. And in my lifetime, I don't think there was a lot of talk about solstice when I was in school. No, it didn't really happen. Now it feels, at least in our little bubble of this coastal city, that this is something we kind of talk about. And just curious for folks, like, what, if anything, does it mean to you this holiday? Mm -hmm. Hey. Yes. I mean, midsummer since, yeah. And that's like a real, actual celebrated festival. Yeah. I don't know much about it. I think it's three days after, according to Google. Uh, but yeah, this kind of celebration. And, you know, of course, here the days are longer, needless to say. But then when you get to like Sweden, I mean, it's like all like, till like 11 p.m. or 10 p.m. it's late. Yeah. 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 And it's so bittersweet because we're supposed to celebrate summer. And yet now the days start getting shorter. <laughs> I don't know. It's feels like a little bit of a trick. Um, but yeah, just it does feel really nice to just acknowledge that the seasons are happening, even if in San Francisco they're a little funny because it's really cold if you live in the sunset. and. Um, but yeah, I was curious if anyone else had other associations or rituals around solstice, anything you try to do or invite in or think about with this holiday. Yeah. Well, I used to participate in this kind of crazy thing up in Marin. It was called the Day Lot, and it was an all day bike ride. And in it, we would leave at five o'clock in the morning with the goal of doing 100 miles on mountain bike. This was not a road ride. Wow. Uh, and that was a, a religious commitment <laughs> to me for very many years. Wow, on the solstice. Yeah, every nice. solstice and every equinox. Wow. So twice a year we could do this yeah. absolute maniacal ride. And it's some of the best memories of my life, mm. but it also represents to me that that's just not something I have to do anymore. <laughs> Sounds like wisdom. And uh, for folks online, there was a description of a called the Day Law, a very long bike ride, almost 100 miles on the solstice, on the equinox. Um, yeah, and you know, this last weekend, I was really fortunate to teach with a wonderful teacher named Alejandro Traul. And some of you may be familiar with him. He's Tenzin Wagyal Rinpoche, is one of his senior students and um, offers beautiful uh, instructions in Tibetan yoga and the tradition of kind of the bun tradition. So the pre-Tibetan Tibetan Buddhism or pre-Buddha Tibetan Buddhism. And then the bun tradition, what was going on in Tibet before uh, Buddhism came over from India is a much more shamanic and connected with the elements. So it's really beautiful to see. And, you know, as we've been reading Old Path White Clouds, it's just so striking that so deeply involved in, in the elements, especially in being close to the earth, right? So not only does the Buddha wake up under a tree and by a river, but the entire monastic community is living in tree, under trees. And this simplicity and connection to nature seems like a fundamental part of what allows the conditions for these practices. So I think, um, yeah, I just feel very appreciative to have the opportunity to think about our connection to the natural world and how we bring that into our practice. I, I don't want it to feel separate, like, oh, we meditate and we think about beautiful philosophical ideas and compassion and wisdom. And then there's nature, right? Like, how do we really bring in <clears throat> this understanding and sense of deeper connection to the natural world um, within our practice? It's something that, um, you know, there's an online eco sattva training I completed this last year with a group of people, of people interested in bringing in understanding and even 
kind of being with the grief of um, the natural world's uh, decline into practice. But for me, uh, I really love, you know, this kind of approach that uh, author and teacher Robin Wall Kimmerer uh, talks about in when you develop a relationship with the natural world in which you feel its abundance, like you really feel like what a gift to receive, right? Even if it feels as though, um, you know, what you're receiving from the natural world is in a supermarket, right? In a package, like really recognizing, oh, when I am eating this berry, I'm eating sunlight and I'm eating water. I'm eating clouds, I'm eating dirt, right? And feeling that real intimate sense of connection and gen- and like kind of nourishment from the natural world. And with that, a natural kindness and generosity can emerge from us. So on this solstice, I'm definitely feeling joy for, I mean, I didn't see much sunshine. I saw sunshine when I got here today, um, but just this, you know, connection, this incredibly beautiful planet that's designed literally for us um so that's what came up for me today and i wanted to start our um our session tonight just a little different so welcome to the sarasco drama collective great to see you all new faces and familiar faces and as we are continuing to make our way through the the epic story of the buddha here as he makes his way through you know, so many beautiful teachings and challenges. Um, One thing I thought about last week uh, in a conversation actually after class was a little bit about our motivation to practice and what is our motivation to practice and how do we really get clear on that motivation to practice? I think there is a general idea um, that probably all of us have since we're sitting here together that meditation is good for us right? It, it's helpful. But I think when we kind of get a little clearer on what is helpful, it can even make the practice itself feel more meaningful um, and can really help us sustain that motivation over time. And so when I think about, you know, like why should we make time to meditate or what is one of the main ways to consider our aspirations for meditation? I like to keep it pretty simple. Most of us, you know, what do we want in life other than to be rich and famous? (laughs) We want to be happy, right? Like that's, you know, we can have other lofty goals, but is everyone here on board with that? Like want to be happy? Yeah. And, and that is so much more complicated than it sounds. That aspiration, that desire for happiness is, um, can be very complicated. And actually for us to even wish for happiness, we have to understand what are the true causes of our happiness? What actually supports our happiness? And so again, our motivation generally wanting to be happy like what is happiness and how do we reach it? And we can start thinking about the ways that in our day-to-day life, we can, we can seek happiness. <clears throat> Some of this can come from our sensory enjoyment, right? So if we got to be outside and feel the sun today, like there's a temporary kind of happiness and enjoyment or eat some really nice food. So that's a, what's often called, you know, the the sensory enjoyment or hedonic pleasures and not hedonic as in hedonism is bad. Hedonic as in it is stimulus driven. Like we feel good because it's something from the outside. There's another kind of enjoyment and happiness that we find in the Buddhist texts and across many um, spiritual and religious traditions. And that's a kind of unconditioned happiness. Not the happiness that we get from something out there, but the happiness that is actually cultivated from within, arguably just kind of revealed and is already within. And that kind of happiness is it's like it's it's getting polished by practice. That's a or you could think of it as maybe our lenses have gotten a little dirty. It's hard for us to see. And practice helps us clean those lenses and see the goodness within us and really sustain and support that aspect of ourself that feels joyful, you know, but not not coming from the outside. And 
I think it's really interesting to kind of look at these forms of happiness together and look at what sustains and supports them. And in some ways, look really closely at and what can be the cost or the obstacle, especially with the hedonic happiness. So with the hedonic happiness, sensory pleasure, and, and even, you know, other people, satisfaction at work can feel really good in the moment. But if we, if we land there, if we build our sense of happiness and well-being in something from the outside, it's a very unstable way to build a sense of happiness because everything's always changing. Right. And even, you know, I really love my, my partner. They just, they make me so happy and just can't wait to get home. And then we get home and they're like in a bad mood, right? All of a sudden they're no longer our source of happiness or we love our work and it's satisfying. And, you know, we care about what we do. Oh my God. We, our manager changes, like everything shifts, right? And not that we don't enjoy what we can enjoy if it's available for us. It's so nice to have, you know, a sense of satisfaction, connection, care, like delicious food. But it's like, where are we orienting or where are we placing um, most of our attention and our energy? So when we think about the, like how much, if we can be honest with ourselves, how much of our energy and attention is towards sustaining our hedonic well-being? Let's go, let's go for percentages. 93. 93. Yeah. Because then you're sleeping. Because then you, that's hedonic, that's hedonic happiness to sleep too, I think. Oh, like when you're sleeping, you're not making it. Maybe depend on your dreams. You yeah. can have some sorry dreams. Okay. Yeah. So maybe not inside. Yeah. So, right. Anybody like around 80, 70, 90, like a lot and, and understandable. I'm not diminishing this, but there's like so much time and effort we put into trying to avoid what doesn't feel good and trying to really like perpetuate what does feel good. Um, for me, this shows up not only in the like way, the things I do, but in my planning mind, planning mind is my biggest obstacle to meditation. Anybody else I'm like some planning mind active? Like it's like, yeah, following the breath, spacious awareness. Wait, what's in the fridge for breakfast tomorrow? You know, like, wait, what time is that appointment? Can I ride my bike or do I have to take the butt? Like just, you know, and it's, it's useful, but it's, it's over indexing on the hedonic well-being. And not knowing and not being able to shift or train my attention elsewhere as it's needed. Yes. It's difficult to do because as a species, we're wired to move away from pain. All right. Absolutely. So the. It's like neurologically, like we avoid pain. Yeah, even, even se like single cell, yes. like, you know, organisms move away from pain. So, so the, you know, the. The reflection is so hard to not get preoccupied with avoiding pain, given that, you know, we're, we're hardwired to do so. And I think the, the hope or the goal isn't that we, you know, just stop caring about pain. It's again, like what percentage of our energy, our attention, like what, and even if it's honestly, it could be just a shift in your point of view, like what matters? You know, and the things that we do that support are what uh, the teacher who I just love and learned all of this from um, in terms of this idea of genuine happiness, Alan Wallace, would he likes to term it also eudaimonic well-being just from the platonic term. And so in Plato's term, eudaimonic well-being is is this kind of well-being about it's it's like the joy of our own inner virtue the sense of our own goodness. And again, this idea of something we're cultivating internally, not what we're taking from the world. And so what are the kinds of activities that we can do that support that type of well-being and happiness? Meditation, right? Hopefully. Um, possibly there's some kinds of, you know, connection with spiritual community. Um, as we were talking about last week, you know, the Buddha says so many times in this book, 
there is no Buddhism, there is no meditation without your spiritual friends. So it isn't as though, okay, you guys are doing the hedonic thing. Don't do that. It's bad. And do this thing totally on your own. That's just really hard, right? It is, it's, there's more of a, a bridge, like enjoy what you can enjoy, but don't think that that is a lasting ongoing source of your well being. It's always changing. And that knowing that fact that it changes actually helps us dedicate ourselves more to the practice that shows up for us. So I'm, I, I'll do another small poll in this room, but generally speaking, have you found that your interest in meditation practice has arisen because everything was going well in your life? Raise your hand. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> Friends online. Did you start meditating because everything was going well? Right. So there are, there are things, unfortunately, most hedonic things don't support us when things are really hard. Temporarily, right? Like if we are going through a heartbreak or loss, ice cream, cookies, Netflix, awesome. Yet, like there's a, there's a question that arises, like a need that arises for more. Something that helps us feel connected to something greater, a sense of purpose, just an ability to be with our own experience and um, really develop a sense of tenderness towards our own experience. So, yeah, I, I just think it's, it's interesting to, to like, like, we don't have to do anything, but just like shifting or remembering that part of the purpose of our practice is to help us understand and identify the true causes of our happiness and the true causes of our suffering. They're, they're connected. When we read together the guide to the Bodhisattva way of life, um, there's a beautiful passage in there. And I'll paraphrase it a little bit, but essentially in like our heedless effort towards sustaining happiness, we trample over the very roots of what could give us happiness. So sometimes the happiness that we are seeking by like reaching here and reaching there is actually, it makes us so tired. We're so busy. We're so occupied and spread thin with our pursuits of happiness we're missing out on like this happiness that comes from the stillness and the calmness of, of you know, being with ourselves. How, how does that sound to you all? It's probably not news, but just curious. I, I love pushback, more reflections. Yes. I always trip over the word happiness because <clears throat> it just sounds like shallow. I've got a picture of a little happy face. Yeah. A little smiling happy face. Yeah. It feels like it's, it feels like, I, so what I do internally when I hear that and the motivation, I always substitute in the word freedom or mm. authentically because some of the people I admire the most are feel like are doing the thing. They're doing, are involved in really Difficult projects and are having a really hard time, but they're deeply immersed. Yeah. And that's authentic and true, and um, they experience a sense of that they're in a sense of freedom or liberation. Mm -hmm. So, I just, you know, it's, nobody has to change their word. Yeah. 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 Did folks online hear that? Or would you like me to repeat? This idea that, you know, this word happiness has a kind of cheesy, flimsy quality, yeah. right? And authentic and freedom feels like a bit more accurate, more, more wholesome. And, you know, it's interesting. I did, and I'm lucky to continue to do work with the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley. And they have um, really, you know, they have the, like one of the main courses that we offer is the, the science of happiness, but on the very first day of that course, which is all based in contemporary psychology, there's like a little bit of a switch and it's like, yeah, happiness, but actually it's meaning, right? What we often consider happiness is a sense of meaning and purpose. So we think of these high arousal emotions like joy and ecstasy. That is literally at a physiological level, just as stressful as anxiety and anger. Like it's a lot of energy. We can't, you know, you know, we go to a big party and you, have a lot of time, friend, like, time with your friends. It's really wonderful. At the end of the day, you're like, I'm wiped out. 
Because even though it was good, it's what's called use stress, not distress. So I think I, I absolutely agree. And I think this word happiness, um, you know, it's the translation for sukha, but it's um, it has a really bad rap in our contemporary culture. It can feel very fake. Um, but I do think it's that sense of kind of I like genuine well-being, too, um, as a word for it. Did you say you stress? Yeah. EU stress. So when stress was first being described and talked about in the research literature, it was you stress, like being so stressed because you're so elated and distress, you know, the, you know, the drain of being in a kind of negative feeling way. Um, stressed. Yeah. The you stress got lost. You never hear that, that anymore. Mm hmm. Yeah. Not you stress. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, you know, all respect to Dr. Keltner mm -hmm. and Rich Hansen, mm -hmm. uh, huge fans. Uh, but I think that simple satisfaction is highly underrated. Mm. That there is this thing, the cult of happiness. Mm -hmm. You know what? There is suffering. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, I don't think either one of those gentlemen would say otherwise, um, but I think it is this potential for toxic positivity in our contemporary culture where if you aren't feeling good or you're not busy, you're not doing it right for sure. Um, but when I think of especially on like the, the spiritual path, you know, like what is our guiding motivation and, you know, what is it we are seeking? Just having that flavor of, or even again, just this compass that is internally pointing us to actually there's something within that's really worth cultivating. There's something within that the cultivation of it, it matters enough that I might give 3% more of my time to it just to really see and, um, yeah, like give that opportunity. So yeah, that was just, that was really, that was really sticking out to me this week. And um, I'd love us to do a practice, which is pretty much the dedicated practice for identifying and working with our experiences of, of genuine happiness and thinking about the obstacles to that genuine happiness. So this is a, like a four fold visioning practice in which it's, you know, an analytic practice. We'll ask a question and internally kind of consider and reflect on the question. And the questions in this practice are, what does it feel like when we're genuinely happy? Like really, what does it feel like? Is there a color? Is there a shape? Are there sensations in the body? Maybe an image or a specific place emerges or arises, genuine happiness. And then the second question is, you know, what do you need from the world to support that? So even though, of course, this is coming from within, we live in a very interconnected world and we do need things from the world to support us. And so what is it that would really support us? And this is a practice of, of loving kindness to ourselves. So as a practice of loving kindness, when we imagine what we want from the world, we do so with this really kind hearted aspiration to ourselves. Maybe we have some of the things we already think we need and that's wonderful. Like, oh, I need a safe and um, supportive place to live. And I have that. But then there might be other things like mm -hmm, I need to feel as though I live in accordance with my values at my work. And I don't have that. And so to really let ourselves kind of feel into and, you know, arise um, naturally, these considerations of what would support us from the world. And then the third part of this um, inquiry practice is, what do I need for myself? Mm -hmm. And that could be, you know, certain behaviors we need to learn or unlearn, certain qualities we want to strengthen. Um, and this one, particularly, it's really important that this doesn't become a like a self-help or negative self-talk moment. So it's not like, oh, I just need to do all these things and I'll never get through them. And that's why I'll never be happy. Like really giving yourself this kind of gift of considering, wow, what what do in my best qualities? What do I have to offer? What do I see for myself? 
And then the fourth is kind of an interesting aspect of it, which even though these first three really have to do with ourselves and our personal reflections, the fourth really target in order for us to be happy, we have to be of service and in connection with the world. Like there's just no two ways about it. Like our individual experience of well-being is within a collective. So how do we want to offer ourselves to the world? How do we want to show up? That's the fourth aspiration. It's in some ways kind of um, like the most important. And the other three are giving us the opportunity to figure out how we can even better show up in that way. One of the things I love with that Greater Good Science Center course and teachings is, you know, this meaning and purpose in life, a sense of satisfaction, really. That satisfaction comes from our altruism, our empathy, our pro-social interactions with others. So there's a, you know, just a really beautiful alignment here with a lot of the description of, um, you know, how we can hold our heart as a heart that has no boundary, really sense of care and kindness to others. And then the contemporary way that we look at that and understand that as part of how our species evolved. It makes so much sense when you think of us all living in like little tribes of 80 to 90 people, you know, literally needing one another for survival. Being kind and sharing makes a lot of sense. And that we are like motivated towards that. It, um, yeah, it's not going against um, what's natural. And of course, there was wars, famines, difficulty, not trying to paint a picture that uh, we once had a had it all easy and figured out and there was never violence or difficulty, but just this reality that kind of collective kindness and understanding ourselves as part of the whole is so natural and it feels so good. So there's a really nice benefit there. So those are our those are our questions for the practice. And before we get started, are there any kind of clarifications around this term again of like genuine happiness or Deep-seated well-being. Any, is that, yeah. So, um, it, I really relate to what you said that meaning and happiness is meaning or having purpose. Um, but then, the question that comes to my mind is that: Do you think there is a situation in which one is obsessed with meaning and having purpose in everything? And so even the hedonic sources of happiness, those should be in service of serving a purpose. Um, just being obsessed with it so much that it just sounds like it's not normal living. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for better and for worse, we can bring our striving to anything. Right. Our, our sense of like, in some ways, like lack or deficiency, and it can become really difficult. Um, for us to even approach our spiritual practice with like openness and um, kind of a flexibility. So we can end up feeling <clears throat> as though seeking meaning or making sure everything in our life is in accordance with our highest values can become very rigid. Yeah. And I do think, you know, this balance is so important. And so I love with our four measurable practices, we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, that the compassion, the kindness, the joy, and then the balance of all of those, right? That we actually know how to use them um, wisely. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, can we be too obsessed with meaning and purpose? I mean, I think it's it's an interesting question, like especially for people who dedicate their lives to service, right? It's really good, right? Dedicating your life to service, to helping others. But there is a point at which it can become um, you know, there's a, a wisdom and a neurotic side to almost everything. And that neurotic side of helping others is often, you know, absent of attending to ourselves or those immediately around us. So even that can become a source of kind of too myopic of fo focus and striving. Yeah, great. Any other questions on like genuine happiness, especially before we try to imagine what it feels like? Okay, be, be so simple. And in imagining an example of genuine happiness, it could have happened this morning, could have happened on your way here. It doesn't have to be, you know, 
when I graduated and I got married and had a baby in the same day, right? Like it doesn't have to be this huge thing. It's like this, this like, I love this um, one, one way it's described as kind of this, just this feeling of such deep alignment internally. Like it just, I am absolutely here doing and being how I meant to do, how I meant to be doing what I meant to do just that feeling. And it doesn't even have to be active. Like I'm doing something, just being here. So. Okay. Huge preamble. So if you'd like to stand up and stretch before we practice, totally welcome. Giving ourselves a couple moments to really settle into the breath and the body. <clears throat> And inviting a sense and quality of stillness in the body. Not only the stillness of not deliberately moving, but the stillness of there's nowhere else to go and nothing else to do in this moment. Allow your attention and awareness to be throughout the body as the body is breathing. See if you can notice and really let your attention ride the breath. As the breath travels in, noticing the sensations through the body. And as the breath travels out, noticing sensations throughout the body. And of course, the mind will go here and there and make that not a problem whatsoever. With kindness, simply return to focusing on the sensations of the breath and the body.
then invite a sense of softening and ease through the front of the body, softening through the forehead and the brow, softening around the eyes and the cheekbones, softening through the jaw. And continue that softening through the chest and the belly. <laughs> And invite a sense of openness and ease just throughout the entire front of the body. And so much of our days we put on a bit of a costume or even an armor protect ourselves behind it as we move through the day. And just consider gently releasing some of that. Allowing there to be a sense of tenderness, a sense of care for this wonderful, vulnerable heart. And alongside this ease and this softening, feel the natural strength, natural sense of vividness and wakefulness that's already here through the spine. And see if you can experience a noticing and a knowing of the breath from within the body. No need for an inner dialogue or narrative about it, just the body breathing. So with the stillness of the body, we can invite a sense of inner silence, even if there's not silence around us. Take a moment and check in on the quality of the mind. Maybe it feels busy and active, maybe a little dull and lethargic. Whatever is the surface quality of the mind, feel or imagine a more spacious, 
the more luminous quality of our greater awareness. Spaciousness and awareness is not located above the neck or behind the eyes, between the ears. This is a sense of spacious awareness of the mind throughout the body, beyond the body. For a couple of moments, we allow ourselves to just be here, noticing when sounds arise, sensations, thoughts, but noticing them from this vantage point of more spacious awareness. This could feel almost as though the mind is like the sky. And all these different phenomena that arise are clouds. They never fully block out the sky. The sky always remains. Taking a moment here now that we've settled into the body and the mind. Consider our intention for being here. Consider the guiding light, the motivation or purpose for our practice.
Hmm, we'll let this intention recede to the background and now shift our mind and imagination to this practice of loving kindness. <clears throat> Beginning by considering or imagining what does a sense of deep seated well being or genuine happiness feel like? Maybe there's a mental image that arises. Maybe there's a, just a felt sense in the body. Maybe you recall a recent time in which you just felt a great sense of inner connection. almost an existential okayness with yourself and the world. It's okay if it's hard to think of an example. You can just imagine what deep-seated well-being can feel like. And with this image or feeling in mind, we transform this image into a practice with our breath. First considering an aspiration of wanting to be connected to this feeling, wanting to know and reside in a sense of genuine happiness and well-being. So with our next inhale, bringing to mind this imagined feeling of well-being and genuine happiness. And with our exhale, this heartfelt aspiration, may I find genuine happiness and well-being. Inhale, drawing in this image and exhale. May I find genuine happiness and freedom here and now and in the future. And seeing if we can really steady this sense and breath, really feel this aspiration. Thinking of our own just desire for well-being and happiness and allowing that to be important, true, meaningful. Once again, as we inhale, considering this vision for genuine happiness, exhale. May I feel and know genuine happiness. I'm allowing the words and phrases to recede. I'm just noticing if there's been any sensations that might have been stirred up in the body, wishing and wanting, identifying what it could feel like to be connected with genuine happiness. And then shifting our attention away from the body and once again to memory and imagination. Considering what do I need from the world to support me in genuine happiness? These could be people or places, resources, circumstances, situations. Allowing yourself to be generous in this considering.
Once again, turning this visualization into an aspiration. On the next breath, as we inhale, we imagine what we could need from the world. And as we exhale, may the world meet me. May I be supported. Inhale, drawing in, really bringing close this idea of being supported. And exhale, may the world support me in my genuine happiness and well-being. Once again, on the rhythm of your own breath and with the words that feel most resonant. In these practices of kindness towards ourselves, it, it can be hard. We can feel like we don't deserve or can't fully imagine what this would be like. Maybe it just doesn't land. It's no problem at all. Just the practice of imagination and inviting kindness to ourselves is a beautiful practice. And so again, taking a moment and just noticing how does it feel in the body? How is the breath? And then shifting and changing our attention once again to visualization, imagination. Considering what do we need from ourselves? What would support our own genuine happiness and well being? Letting this be very generous, kind. What would we like to sustain? What do we need to be relieved of? Seeing what arises naturally, no need to go hunting or finding a to-do list, just considering, just placing this question in the heart and the mind. What do I need to support my own well-being? And again, we'll shift and change and turn this reflection into an aspiration. On the next inhale, bringing to mind that which we could really use. And exhale, may I have the strength and ability to support my own well-being. Inhale, drawing in, imagining these qualities that we could use to support ourselves. And exhale, may I support my own genuine happiness and well-being. And continuing a couple more breaths, really feeling and imagining the sense of rising up to meet ourselves. And wishing this for ourselves so deeply. Really feeling and imagining our own capacity. 
And then again, gently returning our focus to the body. And shifting our attention once again to this, this last question. With our sense of genuine happiness supported by the world and by ourselves, how would we like to catalyze, offer ourselves to the world? Imagining the ways we'd like to show up to those that we care for near us, in the ways we'd like to care for others <clears throat> in the broader community or beyond. What are the qualities of presence? What are the skills and tools? Just imagining this full potential, how we can be of service, connected. And turning this visualization and reflection into intention. Our next inhale, drawing in, considering how we would like to be of service. And exhale, may I show up in the world? May I be of service? Inhale, drawing in, and exhale, extending. May I be support? May I be caring? May I be kind. I'm really seeing if you can connect to that heartfelt aspiration, breath by breath. And again, shifting the focus to the body and the breath.
Thank you for your practice. Thank you. Any questions or reflections on that practice? Anything come up that was surprising? Yes. Do you mind? Thank you. Oh, got a mic runner. I guess um, with the first question of envisioning what happiness felt like, um, I was surprised that for me, because I didn't really think about this when you were talking earlier, but in the visual, the guided um, meditation, it was more, it felt more like um, not this joy, but this like internal sense of calm, almost mm -hmm. like my nervous system was super calm. And I yeah. can remember moments of having that where it's, um, you know, not necessarily like oh, I'm on vacation and I'm really relaxed, but just like even just walking around yeah. and like being very like acutely aware of like, oh my gosh, I'm super like kind of energized, but also really calm in this moment. Like everything feels right and yeah. feels good for no reason. Um, right. Nothing that like no event that happened. And so it's interesting that that's what came up and not, what I thought might come up when you were talking earlier. And I was trying to imagine like happiness, like birthday parties as a kid, you know, like that sort of yeah. um, definition of happiness. So yeah, I found that to be interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. And I think, I think that can be a real quality of that genuine happiness. It's like not in a rush, not behind, but not really like, you know, entertaining or exciting it's it, it is like this calm or maybe like contentedness Content. um, yeah. Yeah. yeah and it is you know it is funny because again um we I, generally speaking even if we don't like the word that much like what we want is to be like happy like what does that mean it look mm -hmm. like we don't we often don't think about it there's a kind of idea and some really interesting research that anticipatory happiness is sometimes better than happiness <laughs> You know, that like, oh, this is going to be so great. Oh, it's gonna be so Like that feeling can often be more pleasant than the thing mm -hmm. itself, mm -hmm. which is really sad. <laughs> <laughs> it might be like a cue or clue that we should look for other forms of contentment. Yeah. Deep seated ease. Yeah. It definitely felt more attainable and maybe sustainable than the, um, I guess, the, the traditional definition of happiness which i know you were um, questioning earlier and it yeah. makes complete sense because yeah it's you know that isn't for all the reasons you said earlier so this felt it was interesting because i was like oh that feels doable yeah that's beautiful yeah and i have to say in, in this practice um, what i noticed was a memory that came up just recently from this weekend in which I was able to be still and present. And what I noticed, you know, in that stillness, it was, there was like um, a sense of contentment, but also there was a presence of grief, but it wasn't a problem. And so it felt like this deep sense of authentic presence too. So it's, uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Reflections, questions. It's a practice I do fairly often every couple months. So I think it's interesting to kind of see what renews or refreshes or what changes. Um, I find it, you know, like the what I want from the world, it feels very indulgent. Um, sometimes I struggle with that one. Um, but sometimes I have a lot of fun with it. Like, like a government that i believed in like that would be really great like why not like imagine that you know and just the kind of hit again of thinking this way towards ourself this aspiration that's so generous and kind yeah yes 
So I realize that in this reflection that I'm mostly happy whether I'm with my by myself or with others when I'm present. You know, so either present just by myself and I'm just walking around. Or for instance, like I was at the office today and I'm, I was working a patient up and I do x-rays and just going from four degrees to two degrees, which for everybody means nothing. But for me, it's just like, whoa, you know, it's, it's, and I'm sitting there thinking like, what? I must be a nerd. Like I get <laughs> happy over just like, you know, that's what I find enjoying, like, you know, doing something. Yeah for someone else, but also the quality of my, what I'm doing in the moment. Um, and it's just like, it's not, you know, being at a party, it's not, you know, a, you know, a new toy or something like that. It's just like sitting down being, you know, present and working on next race. Um, but yeah, so being present with myself or with others is what I, for me, it's what I'm, my, when I'm realizing that I'm most um, yeah. happy, I guess. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. Thank you. I want every doctor to feel that way. <laughs> Everyone who sees any patients. And it's actually, I just, it's it's so beautiful. It, um, it really aligns actually with um, one of the teachings for tonight. So I'm just going to add it here. We can continue to talk about happiness. Um this is, you know, here we are with Buddha, his 14th retreat season, and um, he's at one of the, the beautiful forests where everyone is together and um, spending time in their daily practice, of course, and spending time going begging together. And um, it's interesting because you, know, you think there's probably, I think in, in this context, there's at least 600 other monks. So there you are in a retreat but you're with a lot of people, right? It's not like you're in a cave. And, and as I was mentioning last week, how we are with others is such a big part. Um, and in this case, one of the, one of the lead students noticed that there's one monk who just really kind of like keeps to himself. Um, he just doesn't talk to anybody. And even if there's a kind word, he just kind of goes away. Um, and he, he gets nicknamed the one who lives alone. Um, and this lead student is a little confused and I can ask the Buddha about it because he says, you know, um, is this the kind of self-sufficient sufficiency that the Buddha intended? And the Buddha, um, in the next day in his Dharma talk, he, you know, asked this one monk about, is it true that you prefer to keep to yourself and you do all things alone without any contact with the other bhikkhus and he said yes it's true you have told us to be self-sufficient and to practice being alone um, and he says i want to explain what true self-sufficiency is and what is a better way to live alone a self-sufficient person is a person who dwells in mindfulness he is aware of what's, what is going on in the present moment what is going on in his body feelings minds objects of mind he knows how to look deeply at things in the present moment he does not pursue the past or lose himself in the future because the past no longer is and the future has not yet to come. Life can only take place in the present moment. If we lose the present moment, we lose life. There is, this is the better way to live alone. What does it mean to be, what is it meant by pursuing the past? To pursue the past means to lose yourself in thoughts about what you looked like in the past, what your feelings were then, what rank or position you held, what happiness or suffering you experienced. Giving rise to such thoughts entangles you in the past. And what is meant by losing yourself in the future? To lose yourself in the future means to lose yourself in thoughts about the future. You imagine, hope, fear, or worry about it, wondering what it will look like, what your feelings will be whether you will have happiness or suffering, these thoughts entangle you in the future. Return to the present moment in order to be in direct contact with life and to see life deeply. You cannot make direct contact with life. You cannot see deeply. Mindfulness enables you to return to the present moment. But if you are enslaved by desires and anxieties over what is happening in the present, you'll lose your mindfulness and you'll not be present with life. The one who knows how to be alone dwells in the present moment, even if he's sitting in the midst of a crowd. If a person is sitting alone in the middle of a forest, 
when he's not mindful, if he's haunted by the past and the future, he's not truly alone. And so then he recites a uh, kind of poem to summarize this teaching. Do not pursue the past. Do not lose yourself in the future. The past no longer is. The future has not yet come. Looking deeply at life as it is, is the very here and now. The practitioner dwells in stability and freedom. We must be diligent today to wait until tomorrow is too late. Death comes unexpectedly. How can we bargain with it? The sage calls a person who knows how to dwell in mindfulness night and day, one who knows a better way to live alone. So it's kind of interesting um, that he's saying that being in the present moment is actually how we also are self-sufficient, you know, so it might also be the way that we experience a fullness of life, but also how we can learn to really be <clears throat> on our own. And in an earlier chapter, you hear him talk about just observing with our simple present moment awareness, almost anything leads to awe. Right. We look at the leaf and we see that the leaf was clouds and sunshine and that everything can like be seen just through this true presence with like the X-ray. Right. Or the leaf, just this allowing ourselves to <clears throat> fully be there. And it, it, it is interesting. It doesn't feel like the kind of. You know, end goal or practice for our well-being, just being present. And that is such a refrain across Buddhist practice. But I think it's hard to have it feel relevant until there's a personal experience of it. Um, so, yeah, it was great to have that reflection. Um, any other questions or thoughts on this genuine happiness or cultivating it, how we look for it? Yes, that would be great. Oh, coming to you. Um, I guess I have some pushback. Oh, good. Um, I remember being in college and they asked everyone what they wanted from life. And everyone said happiness, but me. And I said wisdom. Mm. Um, so I have a gratitude, a daily gratitude practice. And the things I'm most grateful for are um, inspirations, yeah. realizations. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if that's really pushback, but yeah, um, it's yeah. I just had different thoughts as you were going. Like, well, my motivation is slightly different, and yeah. And I think I think there is, you know, um, like baked right within that idea of true causes of happiness, we need wisdom, right? There, there's no way for us to understand like the causes of our own happiness without a kind of insight and understanding. Um, and, I, and it could be the differentiator between maybe a hedonic style happiness and genuine happiness is an ability to really know, especially know like the true causes and also the true obstacles to happiness. Um, but I, I totally resonate with that, that wish for wisdom. You know, it's funny. Um, I feel like when I, especially as a teenager, I just, I really wanted to know. I wanted to know. I wanted to understand. Um, and then you get a little more seasoned in life and you're like, I want to forget. <laughs> you know, because it's, you know, there's so much that uh, can feel like heaviness. But, you know, that process of making, you know, turning all adversities into the path. It's a beautiful Lojong slogan of how do we kind of transform all of these opportunities um, that arise that are in the form of difficulties and make them into that like precious jewel. Right? And I think it's a beautiful um, way. And it's interesting because I think wisdom, it can be happy, but it's more that contentment style. Thank you. Anyone else? How, when you were thinking about what you needed from yourself, mm -hmm. how was that? Was there, were you able to come up with things that weren't, you know, too tough on yourself? Felt mm -hmm. helpful? Helpful? 
Yeah. I had a positively blissful insight that, oh my God, I might actually be able to trust myself. I love that. That was, I, interestingly, self-trust came up for me too. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what is it, right? What do we need from ourselves? And it's, it is like, who in the room felt like one thing they could do towards their own happiness and well-being would be doing a little less. No. <laughs> right? Like these simple things. And again, it's hard. And the motivation, it has to be so clear for us to kind of continue to see and continue to see. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it was um, doing a little bit more, but of this. Uh huh. And allowing myself the uh, tiny space. Yeah. To take time out and give myself this. Thing. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So for folks online, um, not doing less, but doing more of like practices um, for oneself and cultivating the mind and heart. And yeah. How about friends online? Y'all are quiet. Any reflections, thoughts? Go oh, ahead. Hey. Yeah. Okay. Jimmy. Jimmy. Yeah, I was, I was sort of along the lines of what was said before about trusting myself. I came up with this, um, or what came up was this thought of, of, of courage, of mm. having the, being able to trust myself that I could do things that are difficult, that, mm. um, that I'm hesitant about, that I hold myself back from, and that, um, you know, it's always a question of, well, am I going to be able to handle this or not? And um, knowing in some cases, yeah, I will be able to handle it. And also knowing that, well, if I can't, that's okay too. I, I don't, I don't want to keep myself from experience. I don't want to keep myself from the potential of experience, experiencing joy in one area mm -hmm. or another. And it's particularly lately in the area of service. Um, mm -hmm by by holding holding back and being afraid of well what happens if I if I quote unquote fail or if I'm just not capable and realizing that you know I'll survive that too. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And I think you know a little bit of the of this um <clears throat> teaching from the Buddha again it's not new. There's something interesting about the repetition in this book of the same teachings over and over, but this dwelling in the present moment has to come a little bit with, in some ways, like a courage to be in the present moment, to not dwell in the past and to not really, you know, perseverate on the future that hasn't happened yet. There has to be a trust and a courage, like, <clears throat> it's okay to be here. Like, I can be here. Um, it can be really challenging to do. Um, but it is, it's so, it's such a, a beautiful practice to give ourselves that opportunity and, and see what it feels like. It can be, you know, so funny that almost all of meditation has been kind of distilled into stress reduction, you know, and, and contemporary science and practice. And it's actually just a byproduct. It's like not what we're looking for, but dwelling in the present moment definitely is reducing of stress. And that's nice, but there's so much more, right? So much more there that we can get from it of really that courage, that self-trust, the wisdom, the compassion. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And to also be kind and generous with ourselves to recognize that, again, percentage-wise, wow, how much of our day are we actually present with what we're doing in the moment? We could do a little research study, just, you know, paying attention for one day, coming back and sharing it. But, you know, the research study that was done in, God, was it 
think it's like 2007 now. No, no, no. 2011 on daily mind wandering, you know, through a smartphone app and people were mind wandering a lot of the time, more than half of the time. And more than half of that mind wandering was not pleasant. It was really unpleasant. Yeah. Um, my question is um, about being present versus, well, for, for me, it's not so much about mind wandering as it is about just like dissatisfaction with mm -hmm. actually, like sometimes it's just with mundane. Like, for example, I find that I'll be sitting at a red light thinking like, oh, I can't wait until this light turns green. And then it's like one block later, I'm sitting in another light and there's always like this fantasy that once that light turns green, like then like the gates will open and I can move on with my life, you know, but there's always going to be another light light or a line. And so I'm and so in those moments, like I'll catch myself and I will wonder, OK, like so how could I be OK just sitting at this intersection? Because a lot of it really a lot of life is kind of mundane, really. Absolutely. And, and do you have any answers when that comes up and you're like, what would it be like to be okay at this red light? Not, I, I do. Well, okay. So the one answer I can say is that overall, I, I feel like if when my self care is better, then it's easier. Like mm -hmm. if I have exercise, if I've eaten well, if I've slept, then it's, then it's easier for me to, to be present in w whatever circumstances, mundane yeah. or difficult or whatever. Yeah. Uh, aside from that, it's something I struggle with because yeah. I'll sit there and I think, well, can I just enjoy looking at that tree on the corner and I'll try <laughs> and I, I, I don't, it's not, I'm still kind of like trying to distract myself from like really just wanting the light to turn green. Yeah. I love that question slash just commentary. Um, a yes, there's so much mundane. And there is so much kind of like anticipatory waiting. I mean, technically in the way that we're describing mind wandering, that is negative rumination and mind wandering, right? Because you're, you know, you're, you're kind of in the present moment, but you're like really ruminating to the future moment, right? Of like that light turning green, like I need it to be there. Um, and I do think, you know, trying to do like the healthy distraction of like, let me look at something and, and find if there's something good about it, it's, it's a nice one, but it's interesting. You said that like, it's when your self-care is better, it's easier to do. And I think what might be actually needed in that time is like care for yourself. Like, wow, I am just totally like contracted, you know, like I just can't focus on anything, but what's next. Wow. Like that, like tenderness towards yourself instead of like, I'm going to apply a strategy I think will work. Admittedly, being kind is a strategy, but I wonder, like, it's like, what is it that's needed in that time? Like, is it something that will focus your attention elsewhere? And part of me is curious that what might be needed is just that kind of like softening towards yourself, right? Just something really simple, like even a compassion practice on the breath of, uh, may this red light be easier for me next time. You know, may I find peace even here. Um, so it's just really focusing on, on the distress and not making the distress a problem because there's a lot of stress around, right. In this, in this time that we live in and in general, um, for those of us who ride, who kind of hang on the higher anxiety spectrum I'm among them, and when you're in that contracted space, it can be very hard to feel the possibility of openness and um, kind of a spaciousness. And I think just being really kind and really clear on that this is hard. Some idea. But yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah. And, you know, there are, of course, like. Jack Hornfield, many teachers talk about red light practice. You know, it sounds like you're already onto that. I didn't know that. Oh yeah. It's, I think you're not alone in this, in this, like, what do I do with the red light? <laughs> yeah. And just like, you know, but very often it's like already what you're trying to do, like noticing something beautiful or focusing on your breath or, you know, technique and method. Um, and I do think it's interesting the kind of 
the mind wandering, some of it can be really enjoyable and almost all of creativity comes out of mind wandering, Mm -hmm. like a positive mind wandering. So it's, it's not like, let's make sure we never have random thoughts. It's just really catching on to ourselves when we're stuck in the rumination. Yeah. One more. Oh, we have a comment from uh, Ron. Did you have something? Oh, I I put my hand down. It looks like we're almost out of time. Um, Go. But go for it. Okay. Um, Well, I had a couple things, but that, 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 so that, yeah, that red light practice, um, that, that is generally my strategy is um, when I'm actually aware enough to apply a strategy <laughs> is, is, is to look for something, you know, to notice what you, what you were talking about. And, you know, and I, and I find that, um, that that strategy off, often brings me to presence, but I'm glad that you brought up that actually, you know, paying attention to what's going on internally is yeah. another way to be present, but actually present with what's going on right here mm-hmm. <laughs> inside. Yeah. Um, the whole practice tonight was beautiful. I was I was very um, happy that I had so many moments of happiness today to to choose from. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and and um, and and one of them, I mean, a friend of mine got me up at five o'clock in the morning to uh, to hike up uh, in the Marin Hills and, and watch the sunrise for solstice. Mm-hmm. So so I started out with um, with 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 a, a beautiful hike, but I, I I had this meditation and I um this practice just led me to uh, uh, really realize, you know, the things, and and I know what they are, but, you know, really kind of categorize the things that, that make me happy and what, what's needed to get them and and what I can look for. But I was Mm -hmm. on a, like a walking meditation um, with, with the dogs. And I just, I just noticed on the ground as, as I found myself very present, I noticed on the ground, this, um, just these shadows, from the trees on the clay. Mm-hmm. And um, there was like multiple levels of shadows, like from three different, you know, a bush and a tree, and then some branches that were all like intermingling and doing this really incredible dance on, on, <laughs> on the clay. And I'm just standing there, just appreciating this, thinking I should take out my phone and videotape it, you know, and mm-hmm. you know, do something like that. But there was a man walking by that I've seen a few times on this trail interesting looking guy he's like an older english gentleman with a with a cane and a beard kind of alan watts looking fellow (laughs) um um, and he stopped with me and he noticed it and we got into a conversation that just was beautiful it was like having a conversation with alan watts in the woods it was we were on the same page on so many things and just this whole moment of um of being present um you know, for some, for the sense of awe that is, is, can be happiness for me at times, you mm-hmm. know, brought me to this other kind of happiness, which is just being in community and, you know, understanding with somebody else that understands me, you know. Beautiful. Thank but, you. Yeah, I love that. Um, so impressed you got up so early too. That's amazing. And that actually the, um, the last thing I wanted to share, which I think I can do in just a moment, was uh, there was this last Dharma talk in this chapter, um, The Treasure of Insight, chapter 51. There's a, um, the Buddha is going to give a Dharma talk for, ch- for the children. And uh, it's on a full moon day. And he asked all, and the children all brought flowers to the Buddha. And the Buddha smiled and he invited all the children to just sit in front of him. And once everybody was seated, he stood up and he picked one of the flowers, essentially. And he did not say anything. And everyone sat perfectly still and he continued to hold up the flower for a very long time. And people were perplexed and wondered what he meant by doing that. And then the Buddha looked over and he smiled. He said, I have the eyes of true Dharma. 
the treasure of wondrous insight. And I have just transmitted this to Maha Kasapa. And then everyone looks to the back of the room and this, um, this monk Kasapa was just smiling so deeply. His eyes had not once wavered from the Lotus. And they also saw that the Buddha was just looking at the Lotus and smiling. And his, he said that, you know, when he looked at just the beautiful flower itself between his thumb and forefingers, that it was just the most beautiful thing possible, pure and wondrous. And that all, everyone else also saw the pure and noble beauty of the flower. And there was nothing to think about. Quite naturally, smiles arose across their faces. And the Buddha said, friends, this flower is a wondrous reality. As I hold the flower before you, all have a chance to experience it. Making contact with a flower is to make contact with wondrous reality. It is making contact with life itself. Kasapa smiled before anyone else because he was able to make contact with the flower. As long as obstacles remain in your minds, you will not be able to make contact with the flower. Some of you asked yourselves, why is he holding up a flower? What is the meaning of this? If your minds are occupied with such thoughts, you cannot experience the flower. Being lost in thoughts is one of the things that prevents us from making true contact with life. If you're ruled by worry, frustration, anxiety, anger, or jealousy, you will lose the chance to make real contact with the wonders of life. The lotus in my hand is only real to those of you who dwell in mindfulness in the present moment. If you do not return to the present moment, the flower does not truly exist. So I just really very much Ron, what you were saying, right? Just how can we make contact with life and what do we need to do in order to make contact with life? So yeah, beautiful. Let's just take one moment, dedicate our practice. <laughs> And again, just returning to the sensations of breath in the body, noticing if anything has shifted or changed in the body. Maybe inviting the possibility that something like genuine happiness could already be here. I'm considering if anything tonight, if an insight or an idea, if even one breath felt that it was a benefit, that we dedicate that. Imagine sending out the benefit of this time together so that all beings could have a sense of happiness and its true causes, that all beings could know freedom, peace, and ease, that all beings could be free. Wonderful to be together. Thank you all.